Hello and welcome everyone. I wanted to thank you for um, attending and welcome you to our What Are the Experts Saying webinar about corporate inversion. I am one of your moderators today. My name is Jenna Ellis. And along with me as co-moderators are Dan Gitello and John Caligari. So thank you everyone, moderators, for attending and helping out. Today, if you have any questions, um, you are automatically muted, and we'll, we'll unmute the lines at the end of the session. But during the session, if you have any questions um, or any trouble uh, with the audio or uh, technical issues, please send a chat, a private chat, chat to Jan Dan Titello, and there's a screen up that shows exactly how to do it. You just go up to the chat feature, drop down to Dan's name, and send him a chat. So any questions for Jim during um, the webinar, please feel free to use that chat feature. Hmm. Our expert today is Jim Hamilton. Jim is the principal analyst and a prolific blogger for Jim Hamilton's World of Securities Regulation. Jim has been tracking, analyzing, and explaining securities laws and regulations for nearly 30 years, and he co-authored the Dodd-Frank Law Explanation and Analysis. Jim was also cited twice as an authority in the Senate Banking Committee report accompanying the Dodd-Frank Act. So welcome, Jim, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jen, and welcome to everybody. So um, before we get to the slides, I wanted to talk about today's session and what we're going to cover. First, we're going to give some history and background of, of corporate inversion, and we'll talk about um, some legislative responses, specifically Democrats and current bills, and then also um, the legislative approach that Republicans are taking, and especially in the lame duck session. And then we'll move to the administration, specifically the Treasury and different stopgap measures. And then, of course, what developments we will be following, um, you know, going forward. Okay, so that's, that's um, what we're going to cover in today's session. And I wanted to turn back then and look at, I'm going to put up a slide here. Um, but while we're, while we're looking at that, Jim, um, can you give a brief overview of what a corporate inversion is? A, corp a corporate inversion is a transaction in which a U.S.-based multinational company restructures itself so that the U.S. parent is replaced by a foreign parent in a lower tax jurisdiction. So it's an, a tax avoidance um, device. And uh, basically, the U.S. company is renouncing its U.S. citizenship to avoid the worldwide taxation system that that is currently in, uh, in, the, in the federal tax code. Great. Okay. Thanks. And so this the slide that, that I had put up is a really um, a really great uh, visual, I think, because if you look at the years, you'll see that for you know about 20 years in the 80s uh, up to the early 2000s. Um, there were 29 corporate inversions in these 20 years. So um, you know, obviously regular but not 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 very frequent and then when we look at this really large spike in the last decade there have been 47 corporate inversions so we went from 29 in 20 years to 47 just in the last decade and here's kind of um, a close-up of that of that spike and if we examine it we can also really see that that during this time time frame I think that corporate inversions became more of a household name or um, a household concept if you will because we're hearing about companies like Burger King and Sara Lee um, um, with you know in the context of these corporate inversions so um, I think Jim and I hope you can start out talking about this that, that, that Congress wanted to move on inversions and what what have they done well I think that the Jenna, what you showed, you know, the tremendous increase has gotten the attention of Congress, obviously here in the 113th Congress, particularly the Senate Finance Committee, which is um, has oversight of the federal tax code, and its chairman, Ron Wyden of Oregon, uh, had some hearings uh, this uh, past summer in September, and uh, and there was a growing consensus that Congress cannot wait for overall tax reform, which everyone wants to see, but must act now to pass legislation addressing the corporate inversion uh, problem. So 
you know, we're talking here about bipartisan legislation to stop what they call the inversion virus. Uh, tax reform is moving slowly. We all know that, and the chairman knows that. And uh, while inversions are moving rapidly, so that brings us back to a um, standalone uh, piece of legislation to address the situation, and that really is the only way. The only way we can really address it um, to get at the root of it uh, right now, but. Uh, Let's move to a few of the bills. Um, the, le the legislative vehicles are out there, and uh, the, the main one is um, a bill introduced by Senator Carl Levin, the Stop Corporate Inversions Act, Senate 2360, which has 22 co-sponsors at the, at the moment. And what it would do would be to change currently, uh, just step back for a minute, under current law, U.S. companies can invert and avoid paying uh, U.S. tax if a merger transfers just 20% of its uh, stock to shareholders of, of an offshore company. By offshore, I mean a non-U.S. company. Um, the Levin bill would raise the 20% threshold to 50% so that if the majority of a company's stock remains in the hands of U.S. company shareholders, it is treated as a U.S. company for tax purposes. So uh, also the bill would bar companies from shifting their tax residences offshore if their management and control and significant business operations remain in the U.S. So that's the second uh, component of, of the Levin bill. Uh, there is a companion bill in the House, H.R. 4679, um, you know, coincidentally introduced by Representative Sandy Levin, Carl Levin's brother, both from Michigan. Um, so that is the main legislative vehicle. There is another legislative vehicle also um, that was introduced by Senators uh, Durbin and uh, Schumer that would uh, do some stripping of profits from companies who did inversion. So that's kind of the, the disincentive uh, that, that we're trying to get at with that particular bill, the Schumer-Durbin bill, the Corporate Inverters Earning Stripping Reform Act, Senate 2076. I don't believe there's a companion bill in the House at the moment. It would uh, specifically target the practice of, of earning strippings in which inverted companies load their U.S. subsidiary up with excessive debt that is owed to the foreign headquarters so that they can deduct interest payments on the debt further allowing the avoidance of U.S. taxes. Um, this is the first legislative proposal to address this practice of earning strippings by companies that move their domicile overseas. And it's designed to work in harmony with the efforts of um, the, the Levin bill. And what, what they're trying to put together in, in the Finance Committee, the comprehensive package. So one of the things that uh, we want to talk about in a minute is the bipartisan nature of this, which this has to be. Yeah. And right. so, yeah, yeah, Jim, I was actually just going to ask that. So, you know, when I'm listening to this, I think it's interesting to note that these were introduced before these, these you know, this last election. And so uh, my next mm -hmm. question really would be, is there any chance uh, during this lame duck session of a bipartisan bill? Well, I think there, I think there is a chance. Um, but not certainly not as, uh, certain. You know, you raise a good point. Um, but even before the elections, though, um, you know, we were moving towards bipartisanship. Um, Senator Orrin Hatch, the who's the ranking member of of the Senate Finance Committee, meaning the top Republican on the committee, who will become the chairman in, in January. They're going to they're gonna flip. Wyden will become the ranking member. But you know, in the in the United States Senate, you need 60 votes to pass legislation, and so even in the 113th Congress, um, you know, you, you know that, that there are not 60 Democrats, so there had to be a bipartisan buy-in. Now, Senator Hatch is has ag agrees in principle that the most pressing international tax problem is corporate inversions. Uh, he wants to do it. He said he wants to do it, but he has certain conditions under which he will do it. Um, I want to go over that quickly because the four hatch conditions are important. 
One of them are that it has to be revenue neutral. The second one is that it has to not, it cannot be retroactive. And the third is it has to serve as a bridge to overall tax reform. And the fourth is uh, it has to move the U.S. tax code to a territorial system of taxation, which was, we don't have right now. So let's take those four um, conditions in, in order and see what we can do. How far apart, you know, the parties are. And bear in mind, the 11 bill would be retroactive to May 1st, and uh, that is supported by the administration. At least at, at the time of the introduction of 11 bill, at the time of the hearings, uh, the administration was supporting a retroactive bill, um, and the they had testimony from from. Uh, Robert Stack, the Treasury Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Tax Policy, and he talked about, you know, it's a permanent loss to the U.S. tax base, permanent loss, when uh, a, a company inverts, and many more are being planned, uh, and Mr. Stack called it a race to the bottom uh, in, in, in the area of tax, and we, we've seen that race to the bottom analogy in Reuters regulation and other things where there's a fear that different jurisdictions with different regulations and some weaker regulations creates the race at the bottom as people try to relocate to a weaker regulatory jurisdiction. And it's kind of the same principle of a lower tax jurisdiction. Um, so the administration, you know, um, supports it and but we have we come up against retroactivity, which I think is a deal killer for for Hatch certainly and the Republicans in, in the Senate. So let's look at that for a minute. Uh, one of the bright spots for that was the Treasury guidance and regulations are, are not retroactive, and uh, I think that the uh, we, we're seeing some people talk about you know uh, that maybe we we can have it be prospective. So that would satisfy that one. Uh, Revenue neutral, you know, I think is 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 easy, fairly easy to satisfy. A bridge to a overall tax reform, that is another condition of of the new uh, soon to be chair of the finance committee. So in that situation, you have um, a message from Senator Schumer, uh, who is the sponsor of the Schumer Durbin uh, earnings stripping bill which mentions that that bill would not be retroactive. So there was a certain cons consensus there um, on the retroactivity issue. This is this is an issue that, you know, has come up. And, you know, I wanted to mention also that um, there was a blog post from Mark Mazur, Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy of the Treasury, noting, trying to counter the opposition to retroactivity, stating that, uh, Retroact retroactive tax provisions are hardly unusual and have been enacted as part of legislation across administrations, including an anti-inversion measure enacted by the Republican Congress in 2004. So, you know, it 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 can it, it has been done before to be retroactive. But in this particular instance, I think that issue of retroactivity is very very strong, and and I think it w it, this bill cannot be retroactive. The bridge, you know, and Senator Schumer mentions that, that his bill is a bridge to overall tax reform. So that phrase is starting to be used on the Democratic side of the aisle. The move to tax code to territorial system is um, a much broader condition. But, you know, that's something that has to be addressed later. And in a sense, these, the, the Levin bill is trying to get out Get, get at the problem of a you know universal or worldwide system that we have now, to, and we try to move to a territorial system. So I think uh, you know the, I think we're closer than people may think to possibly getting and and in corporate inversion legislation in in the lame duck session, which I believe will end. I think the target date now is December 11th for the House. So I'm not seeing the Senate target date. So. Um, so I think that's where we stand with the legislation. I think there's a possibility, and as we move through the session, we have to watch for uh, possibly tacking on a bill like this to a broader bill, like an omnibus spending bill, 
or something, which is a device used in, in lame duck sessions to get legislation passed, a must-pass bill, and then you tack something onto it. And I've seen it happen a number of times. The Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000 was one of the one of those times. It was packing it to a larger a bill at the last minute, and 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 behind the scenes, they they could be working on something. So, looking at the and conditions, think, um, and at it, yeah. And Jim, I think also just to, to one more thing on bipartisanship is that I believe Senator Wyden did um, recently offer a statement on inversion, discussing that. Well, the latest happened. statement, yeah, it was concerning. Uh, you know, we're continuing to examine the issue while focusing on the root problem, the broken tax code. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't want to use the term he blinked, but, I mean, I think that he moved closer to to, to the hatch position a little bit by committing to work with, for the bipartisan comprehensive tax reform. And this would be part of it. This would be a piece of it ahead of the broader piece which a broader reform, which you know, would come would have to come in the 114th Congress at this point. So yeah, I think that's a valuable statement, and we we don't really uh, know where that'll take us. But yeah, thank you. And so outside of this legislation, um, and I think a slight step back to, to going back to what we were talking about pre-election. I know, um, I believe Treasury mm -hmm. then took some action, and can you talk about that? I want to I want to mention that. Briefly, yes, thank you, and you know, but bear in mind, it can never be a substitute for legislation. Everybody right. agrees with that. Even Treasury said that, um, and you know, um, and everybody said it. That yes, it's a stopgap. It's something to get at it a little bit to make it less attractive, make it less attractive. But again, you're talking about incentives versus you know, which is, which is reform. Uh, so it's, it's different. But actually, um, the drumbeat for Treasury, and I say administration action because, you know, it's basically the same thing. And there's, the Treasury is in the executive branch, and it is part of the administration. And I always think, you know, from the years I've cited, that never is Treasury's position different from the administration position. So there's no room there in that area. So. We had some letters. So three senators had written a letter urging executive action. And I say, executive read Treasury, then corporate inversions. And uh, Senator Dick Durbin, uh, Senator Jack Reed, and Elizabeth Warren, uh, key members of the banking committee, the last two, uh, urged uh, ex executive authority to reduce or eliminate tax breaks for companies that shift their headquarters overseas to avoid paying U.S. taxes. As Congress considers legislation, uh, they emphasize the need for immediate action. So obviously, uh, Treasury can act faster than Congress can act. So that was one of the things. Senator Robert Casey also wrote a letter to tr asking for action and to Treasury and uh, ex asking for um, what they're going to do. So Treasury did do something in September um, against the backdrop of, of pending congressional legislation, Treasury acted to reduce the tax benefits and, when possible, uh, stop merger inversions um, to diminish the ability and the, the, actually the benefits. One of, one of these things was um, taking action under the code to uh, prevent inverted companies from accessing a foreign subsidiary's earnings while deferring U.S. tax with the use of creative loans, known as hopscotch loans. So that was one one aspect of it, um, and and I commend to you, you know, the Treasury guidance and the regulations that, that were that were changed. And as we can't go into all of it, but there's a number of actions they took. That was one of them, uh, and so I commend that to you. Are you, are you watching uh, for um, more Treasury regulations then going forward? No, I my uh, feeling is this, that this is it for Treasury. I'm not. No, I'm not not watching for it because I think that Treasury has done what it's going to do with this, with this guidance, and that is it. They will not they will not do anything more, certainly in the short term. I think the ball is in the court of Congress now, and after this short-term, interim action, if you want to call it that, to get at the benefits. But that's trying to make it less, you know, less attractive in some of the aspects that they use, like the hopscotch loans and some other stuff, um, to with it, but it doesn't get the pro the root thing of of, the, of doing it and to prevent people from doing it. So, 
But I don't expect any more from Treasury on this, um, no. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, <clears throat> I just wanted I wanted to take some questions, but before that I wanted to, to tell um, all our participants that after this session we will be, because we're showing securities regulation daily, we will be um, sending out all of the slides to you. Um, so you will be able um, to specifically read this article as well. But I, I got two um, or a couple of questions, Jim, if you can, um, that we got via chat. So um, I wanted to open it up to questions and then specifically ask you these two that came in during the, during the session. Uh, the first one is, what about the possibility of a tax holiday to repatriate money offshore? Well, that's been discussed, and I think it may certainly be proposed, and uh, that kind of gets at the, uh, at the system uh, that we have, where a um, worldwide system where activity is taxed, and wherever it is, it's the U.S. taxes on a worldwide basis, as opposed to the territorial system, which um, taxes the activities in, in the jurisdiction in which, which they occurred. Um, in that sense, I want to mention, um, you know, to give it a broader perspective, um, and then, well, these profits are, or then they attempt a holiday to repatriate them back to the U.S. without paying the tax. Um, the Erskine Bulls, uh, Alan Simpson Commission, the National Commission, Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, I commend that to you always, and their recommendations, it's about four years ago, and they talked about it. I want to put in this perspective, perverse incentives, perverse incentives under the current system. Uh, and, you know, th this recommended a move to a territorial tax system. That's the root of the whole problem. And, you know, uh, we want to put that in that perspective, that U.S. corporate tax law is a pa patchwork of overly complex and inefficient provisions that create a perverse incentives. And that's, you know, that was what, Erskine Bowles, you know, the commission, the Bowles Commission said, and uh, they, they have a blueprint. So I think I want to put it in that context. One, one other thing, um, there was a draft, discussion draft bill from the House Ways and Means Committee, 113th Congress, uh, Representative Camp, Chairman Dave Camp, uh, to move the U.S. to a territorial system. This never got in even to legislative language because I call it is a discussion draft. But they were trying to get a tax reform act going. It never happened in the 113th. But again, that's what we're talking about. That that would that would be to end why people do it. You know, because the the, ta the, the so-called broken system and the perverse incentives. So yeah, uh, that's that's the root of, and that's why you have repatriation. The need for it. I mean. Uh, you said there was another question. Jenna? Yes, sorry. Hi, oh, yeah, I was on mute, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so the next question is the activist or Allergan uprising in Ireland. What is yeah, the update? Well, well, that's just one that just came out. Uh, the um, Allergan company in California to um, do a corporate inversion with a company in Ireland that's much smaller. That, activists and it, it's kind of a recent example of a classic you know corporate inversion where you have a ten um, no, I believe the corporate uh, tax in Ireland is 10.5 or 12.5 I'm sorry I don't <clears throat> exactly what but in any event it's much lower than to the US and Ireland is a popular uh, inverting invert for inverting um, so you know, this this is something that you know is still going on. So um, we we see it as a classic as a classic case, and um, and affects the shareholders and everyone too because they can they consider that a, a sell a sell sell the shares on the inverting company. Okay, great. So uh, Dan, I will ask you then. Did you have any other questions? Other chat questions? No, I think um, other than I think you answered the two. No, I think you answered the two that were uh, that were out there. No, no other questions. Okay, great. Well, in uh, in conclusion, then I wanted to thank everyone for attending, and of course, thank you so much, Jim Hamilton, for being our expert. Mm -hmm.
today and always. Thank and you, um, I want I wanted to uh, also follow up just again to say that there will be a really short survey that I'm going to send out along with these slides um, and Jim's Securities Regulation Daily article. Um, and so if you could do that, it's just a, a, like a four or five question survey, that would be great. And you'll also get those slides via email, um, I believe, uh, later today or early tomorrow. So thank you so much for attending this What Are the Experts Saying Corporate Inversion. If you have any additional questions, my email is on the screen. And of course, any requests for training for your organization, um, you can request it via legaltraining at walterschooler.com. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day.